In 1859, Charles Darwin published a book that would radically change our understanding of the world. On the Origin of Species contained Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection, one of the most important scientific ideas ever conceived. The book contained experiments and observations of the natural world, distilled into a single persuasive argument that explained the evolution of living things on Earth. For the first time in our history, we could explain how life on our planet developed into the extraordinary diversity of species that we see around us. But perhaps most importantly, the theory explained where we came from. Now, more than 150 years on, Darwin's theory forms the foundation of modern biology. We can't overestimate how profound an idea this was. Now, most people know the story. In the early years of the 19th century, Darwin went off on a voyage around the world on a ship called the Beagle. He visited exotic islands. He saw Galapagos finches and giant tortoises. He experienced volcanic eruptions and earthquakes. And by the time he returned four years later, he'd solved one of the most intractable problems of Victorian science. It's a great story, but it's not true. In fact, most of Darwin's work on his theory of evolution took place in nowhere more exotic than here, in the heart of the English countryside. When Darwin returned from his voyage around the world, he spent more than 20 years working on his theory. He did this by simply observing what was around him, in his garden, in his greenhouse, and in the fields surrounding his home. It was here, in picturesque rural England, that he put together the intricately detailed argument that would become one of the greatest scientific theories ever. So what was it about Darwin that allowed him to see what everyone else had seen in a way that no one else ever had. Before Darwin published his theory, people thought differently about how species came to be. Some accepted the idea that species change over time, but in a different sense to how we accept evolution today. They thought that each individual species was created first by God, then was free to adapt to its environment. As each species changed, it rose upwards, gradually improving itself as it strove to reach perfection. Many other people still held to the biblical description of a world made in a week and populated by God with animals and plants that were unchanging, perfect and fixed for all time. Darwin's theory swept away these and other ideas about the natural world. When Darwin looked around him, he didn't see creatures created specially by God, but rather a family of organisms, a web of life in which all living things were related to each other. Now, when Darwin was formulating his argument, he opened his notebook and he wrote, I think. And he drew a diagram of a branching tree like this. The branches of the tree represent species, and the closer the branches are to each other, the more closely related those species are. Everything in the tree starts from a single line. Darwin realized that all species were descended from a common ancestor, a single origin of life, just as a single seed gives rise to the branches of a tree. All species had arisen by a natural process from this single origin, each new species branching off the tree of life in a continuous and unavoidable process of change called evolution. People were thinking about evolution before Darwin and the evidence was there all around them. So why was it Darwin who finally found the answer? Was he just in the right place at the right time 
or was there something about him that made him different to everyone else? The story of how Darwin gave his theory to the world starts during his early life as a university student. Darwin had already given up on a medical degree at Edinburgh, so his father sent him here to the University of Cambridge, where he studied to become an Anglican priest. But the young Charles was not a model student. Although eventually he passed his degree, he concentrated less on his studies and more on a collection of pastimes and hobbies. The evidence for one of these hobbies still remains. Darwin considered his academic life at Cambridge three years wasted, but there was one thing for which he developed an absolute passion. Collecting beetles. Now this is a box of beetles that Darwin collected as an undergraduate. He was obsessed with them, but not for any particular scientific reason. What drove him was the sheer thrill of discovery, of collecting one more beetle, adding one more species to the set. It was a hobby, but it was a hobby that was all-consuming. No pursuit at Cambridge was followed with nearly so much eagerness or gave me so much pleasure as collecting beetles. No poet ever felt more delighted at seeing his first poem published than I did at seeing in Stephen's Illustrations of British Entomology the magic words captured by C. Darwin, Esquire. Although beetle collecting was a hobby to Darwin, the way he went about it, the way he chose his specimens, tells us something important about his character and hints at the scientist he was to become. In London's Natural History Museum, Max Barclay is the curator of the beetle collection that houses some of Darwin's most important specimens. Darwin's obsession with beetles went back to his, his teenage years. There are stories of him spending Christmas with his family and writing to his beetle collecting friends saying, I'm dying by inches here from having no one to speak to about beetles. And as a young man, he was given the job as a, um, a gentleman companion to the captain on the Beagle Voyages, which was a five-year circumnavigation of the world mapping the South American coast. And what Darwin was doing is while he was traveling, every time the beagle stopped in port, he was collecting whatever beetles he could find. Darwin's collecting on the beagle followed a long tradition where European naturalists would bring back exotic specimens from faraway lands. Firstly, this was simply to fill cabinets of curiosity, but later their interest became more scientific. Darwin's collections and observations would eventually form crucial parts of the arguments that upheld his theory of transmutation, of species changing over time. Just a generation before Darwin, one of the most important natural history collectors was Joseph Banks. Banks sailed on the Endeavour voyage under Captain Cook and collected so widely that he had over 80 species of plants named after him. Many of Banks' specimens are now held alongside Darwin's at the Natural History Museum. This is some of the oldest material housed here at the Natural History Museum. This is material collected by Sir Joseph Banks. He was one of the first naturalists uh, to, to visit Australia, one of the first naturalists to visit Hawaii, and he came back to Europe with all kinds of new species, plants, animals, and a reasonable number of insects. Now in this drawer we have material from Darwin's Beagle Voyages. And this was 50, 60, 70 years later. And if you look at the average size of the beetles in this drawer, and you compare it with the average size of the beetles in Banks's collection, you can immediately tell which of these people was going to come up with the intricate and meticulous theory about the origins of life. Because Darwin was picking up the minutiae. He was picking up the beetles that were just one or two millimeters long, whereas Banks was focusing on the, uh, on the big and the obvious and the dramatic. Unlike many other naturalists, Darwin's collections weren't just for the sake of curiosity. 
He would later use his specimens and observations as persuasive points when he tried to gain acceptance for his theory. We are still finding new species in Darwin's materials. And uh, this species, for example, uh, is described in the 1970s as a new species based on material that Darwin collected in the 1830s. So that sat for 140 years before the right scientist was born who could recognize that as being a new species. But it's never been seen before or since. There are no other specimens of that apart from the material collected by Darwin on the Beagle Voyages. So at the beginning of the Beagle Voyage, some of his early experiences got him thinking about the transmutation of species and how species could change. When he was in the Atlantic Islands, he had read the works of another entomologist, uh, Thomas Vernon Wollaston, who had observed that a large percentage of the beetles on those islands were unable to fly. And Darwin made the same observation. And he was thinking, why are they unable to fly? And the obvious conclusion is, is that if they were able to fly, they could be blown out to sea and, and therefore destroyed. And consequently, he wondered how they had lost the ability for flight. <laughs> The standard explanation of the time would say that the beetles were created this way by God, like all other species. But this was an idea that troubled Darwin. Why would God create a beetle that had wings, but was completely unable to use them? The view of an independent creation of flightless insects by a benevolent creator who wanted to save them from being blown out to sea was almost impossible because of the volcanic origin of the islands that they're only a few million years old. So Darwin began thinking that they must therefore have been the descendants of ancestors that had been able to fly and that because it was beneficial to them to be unable, they had lost that ability and the flightlessness had been passed on to the descendants. He was thinking about this idea as he crossed the Atlantic, and by the time he got to the South American coast and the natural laboratory of the Galapagos Islands, the idea was already quite well formed in his mind, and he was able to collect a great deal more evidence. And by the time he came back to England, the idea of transmutation of species and species changing in ways that benefit their survival were already very, very well formed in his mind. the seeds had been sown that would grow into Darwin's great theory. From this point onwards, Darwin's life would be devoted to persuading others that his ideas were true. But before then, he had to fill in the gaps in his hypothesis. In short, he had to persuade himself. After the Beagle voyage, Darwin returned to England, inspired by the natural history and geology that he'd seen. And he had the idea that species might change over time, but he hadn't yet worked out how or why that might happen. So he started looking at domesticated animals, and he thought if humans could selectively breed plants and animals to produce new forms, then perhaps the same thing happened in nature. There were more crucial elements that led to the theory. Darwin knew that within a species there was variation, individuals had slightly different characteristics. There might be variations in colour, size, strength, behaviour. So in a species, some individuals might be better suited to their environment than others. Darwin's final insight came when he read this book, an essay on the principle of population by Thomas Malthus. The book explained that human populations left unchecked would explode until they outstripped their food supply. The same with plants and animals. If every seed turned into a new plant, if every tadpole turned into a new frog, they'd soon take over the world. In reality, there's a struggle for existence and very few actually make it. Those that do make it pass on their characteristics to the next generation. And it's this fight for survival over many generations that gave Darwin the final inspiration for his theory. It at once struck me that favourable variations would tend to be preserved and unfavourable ones to be destroyed. The result of this would be the formation of new species. Here then, I had at last got a theory by which to work. <laughs> 
Now, Darwin's work really began. Not only did he have to work to collect evidence for his theory, but he had to go about introducing his idea to the scientific community to try to get them to see what he had seen. The species question was one of the great mysteries, riddles for natural science at the time. And when Darwin came back from the voyage, he had um, found this clue to the possibility that species might change. When he found this idea, he realized very quickly how powerful it might be to explain so many different aspects of natural life. He realized, though, that the idea was going to be deeply shocking to all respectable people because it contradicted the first book of the Old Testament, Genesis. At that time, not only would ordinary people be shocked, but respectable scientists were so loyal to the Church of England, to orthodox religious opinion, that they would almost certainly reject the idea out of hand and would very possibly, because it would be seen to be heretical, they would actually reject him from the community of scientists. He came to realize that in order to build the theory and eventually present it to other people and hope to be able to persuade them that it was sound, he would need to do a great deal of further work to um, develop points in the theory and also gather all the evidence that could persuade his audience. He needed to study ecological interactions in communities of wildlife in one place to see how they worked in detail close up. At the time, Darwin and his young family were living in central London, far from close up to any natural environment. After a long search, they moved to a picturesque village in rural Kent, where he found the ideal setting for his work, a country mansion called Down House. Although he found the house itself to be unremarkable, its gardens and the surrounding countryside were perfect. After his first observations that gave him the first clues for his theory on the voyage of the Beagle, almost all the rest of the observational and experimental work he did on natural life, he did at Down House in places on animals and plants that he could observe and experiment on just within walking distance of his own home. The house and its surrounding gardens and fields became Darwin's living laboratory. It was here over the next two decades that he would experiment and gather the evidence needed to persuade the world of his big idea. In those decades spent collecting evidence before the publication of his book, Darwin's experimental subjects were hugely varied. He worked on surveys of plant diversity, prevention of self-fertilization, seeds in pond mud, artificial selection, bumblebees buzzing places, seeds eaten by birds, honeybees building honeycomb, bumblebees robbing foxgloves of nectar, attachment of aquatic snails to ducks' feet, seeds in birds' droppings, clover, bumblebees, field mice and cats, and many, many more. Darwin looked at some things that would have been felt by most other scientists at the time really to be of no conceivable interest or value at all. 
We're situated 100 yards from where Darwin actually kept and bred fancy pigeons. And in fact, he became another Victorian pigeon fancier. He started off with two breeds, a pair of pouters and a pair of, a pair of owl type birds. And then he, within a couple of months, he ended up with 50, 60 birds. So he became a true pigeon fancier. Such was his enthusiasm for studying these birds. A fancy pigeon is a Columba livia, which is exactly the same as a street pigeon. The common name is rock dove, uh, and Columba livia is, is literally Latin for pigeon grey. Man has domesticated uh, the street pigeon for, for thousands of years, uh, for food initially, and then for message carrying in the Middle East. And throughout history, we've had pigeon houses. All the breeds you see before you now have been kept for many, many years over the centuries. The bird I'm holding now is an owl, but it resembles very closely the turbot of Victorian times. And Darwin was particularly interested in such birds because of the very short beak, as you can see here, extremely short beak. And he compared such birds to scandaroons, which had a particularly long beak. He discovered that birds with smaller beaks had a correlation with smaller feet. The other part of the correlation was birds like the scandaroon with a longer beak had bigger feet. Darwin wanted to prove that if you crossed different breeds, different fancy pigeon breeds, that their offspring would breed true and that they would breed Columbolivia rock doves. So he wanted to produce a uh, grey pigeon with a bar, which he ultimately did in the second generation. And if he could prove that, he could prove that life had developed down from common ancestors. And that was the main reason the pigeons were so useful, because with them being so diverse, it was difficult for most people to, to believe that they could possibly have come from an ordinary pigeon. Darwin relied on fancy pigeons to argue his point in the first chapter of The Origin of Species but he still had a long way to go to persuade his audience. As Darwin wrote each chapter of The Origin of Species, he was thinking all the time about the arguments that would be put up against his suggestions. And he was aware that one argument that would be made and that people would think was the most effective and he would have to have a really strong answer to was the argument about the mathematical perfection of the honeybee's honeycomb. How on earth, other than by divine guidance, guidance by a kind God who is looking after everyone's and all creatures' concerns. How on earth could the honeybees in the confinement and pitch blackness of the inside of their hives create perfect hexagonal cells, cell after cell after cell, all fitting exactly with each other? This problem was broadly known as the argument from design. To solve it, Darwin needed specimens like the nests held here in the Natural History Museum. Bees make cells in their nests to lay their eggs and to store provisions like honey. Darwin knew that in contrast to the honeybee, the larger bumblebees constructed simple round pots for their cells. They arrange these pots in a haphazard way that forms their small underground nests. At the opposite end of the spectrum was the elegant complexity of the honeybee's hexagons. If Darwin could find something in between the two, he might have a clue to how honeybees' nests could have evolved. After years of searching, he finally came across a specimen nest of a tropical stingless bee called Melipona. Melipona sometimes makes simple round pots like the bumblebee, 
but when these pots are forced next to each other, they squash together in tight rows. When this happens, they start to resemble the hexagonal structure of a honeybee nest. This example from nature showed Darwin that the hexagons needn't be formed under the instruction of a creator, but occurred spontaneously as round cells were pushed together. In other words, the hexagons were not divine, but completely natural. That explanation that when creatures build circles next to each other and the circles join and press together, they form hexagons. He offered the argument and it has stood the test of time and now is the answer to the argument from design for the theory of evolution. Darwin spent 20 years at Down House collecting evidence to write his big book on natural selection. Every moment of his work added to the body of persuasive proof for his argument. He wasn't willing to unleash his theory on the world without all of the evidence necessary to convince people it was true. Now, many of his archives and correspondence from that period are held here at the Cambridge University Library. So as Darwin was working on his big book on natural selection, he's got a number of strands that he's working on all through that time. He's making connections with people all over the world. And in fact, one of those people that he made connection with was a young man who was out collecting in the Malay archipelago, Alfred Russell Wallace. So you can imagine Darwin sitting at home at Down, having spent 20 years of his life uh, working on gathering the evidence to support this, this theory, this idea of the mechanism of natural selection. And then he gets a letter from Alfred Russell Wallace. Wallace has sent him an outline of exactly the same mechanism and has asked Darwin to pass it on and get it published. So here he is in great despair because, because 20 years of his life had, had just been overtaken by someone else with, to whom he thought he would have to concede priority. He thought that this was, this was the only honourable thing to do. Darwin at the time was coping with a very serious outbreak of illness in his family. He had several of his children were very sick and in fact his youngest son died um, at, at exactly that moment, really, a few days uh, after the letter from Wallace arrived. This was the third child that Darwin had lost to illness. Understandably, he was completely devastated and almost gave up hope. His work may well have stopped here, if not for his friends in the scientific community who had witnessed his decades of work. It was them who helped him come up with a solution. What happened was that they arranged for both Wallace's outline and a very rapidly written paper by Darwin to be read together at a meeting of the Linnaean Society. That made very little impact. I think it's very interesting to remember that, that those two papers really almost sank without trace. But Darwin was spurred on by, by now and knew he had to publish. He had been warned over and over again, actually, in the preceding years by those who knew what he was doing, that he stood the risk, he ran the risk of losing his priority. Now he so very nearly had. He wrote what we know of as origin of species extremely rapidly and published it. This is another of the great treasures of the library. This is a first edition of On the Origin of Species. But this one belonged to Alfred Russell Wallace with a signature in the front. Shortly after Origin appeared, a letter was published in the Gardener's Chronicle from a man called Patrick Matthew, claiming that he had actually come up with the theory of natural selection nearly 30 years before Darwin in a book that he had written in 1831. Uh, the book was about naval timber. It was actually a very important part of uh, economic botany. Uh, it was important to the country to know how to grow wood to make ships. So it wasn't a completely obscure book, but it wasn't one that Darwin had come across. Within just a few days of Matthew's letter being published in the Gardener's Chronicle, um, Darwin had got himself a copy of Matthew's book on naval timber, and this is it, this is Darwin's copy, April 13th, 1860. There's a few of Darwin's notes at the back there. Darwin immediately conceded 
uh, wrote back he, to, to the Gardener's Chronicle saying that indeed Patrick Matthew did appear to have come up with the same mechanism and excused himself on the grounds that he could not really have been expected to find it in the appendix, very briefly stated in the appendix to a book on naval timber. This is the appendix to the book where Matthew actually wrote his version of the theory. And the theory was written in the book without any kind of supporting evidence. Uh, and if you could just compare that to the size of origin of species, I think you can see that Darwin had a pretty good point, really. So it really doesn't matter that others had thought of the theory before Darwin and even mentioned it in print. What matters is that Darwin was well placed because of all the work that he had done, the 20 years of work that he had done, to support and substantiate that argument. He was also well placed to have it accepted by both the scientific establishment and the wider public. And that is what he gave us. He brought this idea into scientific orthodoxy. When we think of Darwin, we tend to remember his journey towards the moments of inspiration, the times when all those pieces fell into place. But in fact, Darwin wasn't unique in conceiving the idea of evolution, of natural selection. He wasn't even the first. But in a sense, these ideas didn't exist before Darwin. It was only after years of collecting evidence and convincing others that these theories came to be accepted. And we could probably say the same about most scientific ideas that we now hold to be true. Darwin's work continued right up until his death and his legacy endures to this day. His gift to us was not the result of a few moments of inspiration, but of a lifelong act of persuasion. There's one passage in Darwin's writings which I particularly love. It's the last paragraph of The Origin of Species. There is grandeur in this view of life with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one, and that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. <laughs>